Hi, everybody. Um, I want to thank um, Irina and the conference organizers for putting on what's already at the first day, a really awesome conference. I've really been <coughs> enjoying all the talks today. Um, sorry about my complicated title. Um, I really want to talk to you today about um, kind of recent concepts that I've been considering about energy conservation and energy flow through the first cells. Um, and this is kind of preliminary data that I'll present, a small amount of that, and some concepts that I hope um, can foster some discussions um, with everybody. And so what I've seen today, and I hope to see during the rest of the presentation, are um, more and more puzzle pieces that we might eventually be able to put together and have a better idea of how, how all this got started. Um, so when I think about um, what the first cells were doing and what their first physiology was, I, I often remember that all life is using um, energy in the form of chemical potentials um, and putting that through the cells and organizing the cells that way. Of course there's photosynthetic cells, um, but light converts chemicals into high energy molecules and th those are subsequently used. Um, sometimes it's convenient to divide energy flow in biological systems to a, a maintenance process. That is, how much energy does it just keep me, just does it take for me to stand on the stage or if you're a, a microbe, just to sit there and do your thing. And then there's the reproductive cost, which is really, really high. I don't have kids yet, but um, I hear having, having offspring is hard. It's also hard if you're a microbe, I assume. Um, but these are the kind of the two different pies that we can d divide energy flow through when we consider um, life. And so uh, a really fascinating question for me is, is what are the first energy flows that organized material in a way that resulted in what we call biology today? And that's kind of what I, what I really want to talk to you about. Us biologists, we use kind of funny, conver co funny words um, to talk about energy flow. And we, we use this term called energy conservation. And it took me a long time to really understand what that meant. And so I want to talk uh, about that in a very basic way um, with you today so that we can all get on the same page about what it means. Um, it really means saving energy and not losing energy um, to the environment in the form of heat um, and just dissipating it. Using the, the energy from the environment from sets of chemical reactions tempor to temporarily hold matter in an organized state. So sometimes I think about it more in terms of how can a chemical reaction save energy during the reaction progress. If you talk to any biologist about it, they'll say, oh, the energy conservation works this, say, this way or it works that way. And you might ask, what does it mean to conserve things? I, I would encourage you to think about like, oh, the organism is saving energy along that reaction and it's organizing itself temporarily um, with that flow. And so I'm going to um, talk about um, possible energy flows that might have been occurring at hydrothermal events that might have organized material in the very, uh, uh, from the start. Um, it doesn't mean that I think that hydrothermal events are the place that life happened, but I think they're interesting to consider because there's a sustained uh, source of energy that uh, flux coming out of them. And because I chose to talk to you today about hydrothermal events and the origin of life, um, I wanted to um, just quickly bring up and go through um, a recent paper that also just dis discusses um, energy flow and physiology that's happening um, at hydrothermal events. And I want to do this because um, since I'm a th I think a lot about hydrothermal events and the origin of life and also contemporary life, people um, recently asked me about this paper and what do I think about it. And um, I'll tell you what I think about it in a couple slides here. Um, the goal of this paper was to analyze all contemporary genomes and find out what is the common set of proteins or enzymes that are found in the last common ancestor of bacteria and archaea and say and to be able to use that information to comment on what the physiology of that organism was. You can argue whether or not that's a valid approach at all as in does it make any sense or how much sense how sure can you be just from genome analysis when you're talking about something that happened around four billion years ago but it's one way to go about it um, presumably there is a record contained in our genome that we can derive information from and the way that these authors chose to do it is quite simple and it's nice that they made it simple they used two criteria to judge the presence of a, a protein or a gene in the common ancestor of archaea and bacteria one the presence should be the protein or the gene should be present at, in at least two higher taxonomic groups, and I'll describe what that means in a second, um, of each bacteria and archaea. And the second is that if you draw a phylogenetic tree of this protein, individually it should split the archaea and the bacteria just like a ribosomal or an elongation factor gene would. 
So what, what do they mean by that? They mean something like this. Here on the left are bacteria in blue. And if you squint your eyes or if you've got good eyes, you can see that there are two dark blue lines on the bacterial tree. This would be representing that a protein or a gene is present in two higher taxa of bacteria. And on the right, um, we've got this other group of organisms that we call the archaea. And if you look closely, there's two dark red lines. And this would be indicative of two of these um, genes being present in the archaea. And if you found a protein that looked like this, according to these criteria, you would conclude, OK, this, this is a good candidate for something that was present in the last universe and universal common ancestor, or as I like to, to call just the last common ancestor of bacteria and archaea. And in the paper, um, they're thinking about hydrothermal vents. And they come up with this scheme. And um, when I was reading this paper, it really caught my eye because they included a nitrogenase and also radical SAM proteins inside of those. And those are these proteins here. And I just want to discuss um, briefly what the phylogeny of those proteins looks like and whether or not this is a, a valid conclusion to include in their data set. What is a nitrogenase and what is a radical SAM protein? Uh, a nitrogenase is the only known biological catalyst that can take N2 from the atmosphere and turn it into ammonium. And so this is this vertical reaction on the left here where you take nitrogen gas plus six electrons. You, sp you spill off a couple of electrons on hydrogen. The, uh, the enzyme can't hold on to the electrons, and so you always make a little bit of hydrogen. Um, you have to push the reaction forward with ATP. And um, this is a, this is, uh, a phylogenetic tree of the actual catalytic subunit of the protein that's drawn on the left. And so what we would like to ask ourselves at this stage is where are the archaea in this tree and where are the bacteria? Does it recover the archaea bacteria split? And is it present in two higher taxa of each of these? Same question we can ask for this radical SAM uh, protein family. Radical SAM protein family, it, they all carry out the reaction shown on the right. They take S adenosyl methionine, um, which is a cool sulfonium ion, um, and they donate uh, a single electron from an iron sulfur cluster onto that sulfonium ion, and then they make this deoxyadenosine radical that you see on the right. And that deoxyadenosine radical can go on and do almost any chemical reaction that you want to dream up. It's a wonderfully and amazingly diverse chemical, uh, chemically reactive enzyme. Um, it's found all over the place in biology. It's prob it probably is a good candidate um, to include in the LUCA. But what does, what does the phylogeny look like? Um, so I want to just talk about those two protein families uh, today. First, the nitrogenase. Um, is it present in two, two higher taxa of archaea and bacteria? Well, actually, the nitrogenase is only present. It's restricted to a subgroup in, in, a, in one particular phyla of archaea. So it, it's actually well restricted within the archaea. It's only present in methanogenic urearchaea, which is surprising. It's actually surprising that it's not distributed more widely. Again, it's the only known biological catalyst to take nitrogen from the atmosphere and put it into biomass. Should be awesome to have this in your genome. It's only present in methanogenic urearchaea, as far as we know with our sequences to date. Let's take a look at the nitrogenase and ask ourselves where the archaea and the bacteria branch um, within one of these trees. Here I've colored all of the archaeal sequences in red. And since it's kind of hard to see, I just put a little orange um, arrow on those sequences. And so you, you can see that the archaea branch super, super polyphyletically within this. And this doesn't look a lot like this tree on the left, where the bacteria and the archaea are split. And, th and they, that leads us to call them archaea and bacteria and give them the, the designation of different domains. The nitrogenase tree doesn't look like that. So what I want to suggest to you is that based on the author's criteria that this is, is not a candidate to put um, into the last common ancestor of archaea and bacteria. So I'll put an X through that. And um, briefly, I want to run through this radical SAM protein family. Is it present in all sorts of archaea and all sorts of bacteria? It is. It's a super, super widely used enzyme family. It's, it's a pretty simple protein fold. It binds an iron sulfur cluster. It uses this common substrate. It generates a radical mechanism, and then that, go, that radical can go off and do all sorts of nice things for the cell. But if you look at a phylogeny of it, again, you see that the archaea split up the bacterial distribution um, a lot. There's a lot more black lines on this plot and also the, on the previous plot, but this is because this is a sequence artifact because we don't have enough archaeal genomes right now. However, regardless of that, you can see that it does not recover the archaea bacteria split. Um, and therefore, um, I'd like to suggest that um, we cross this off of the list. And so um, 
I want to use this kind of as fodder to uh, get you to come to the very last session um, of the symposium, uh, the after shop that I'll be chairing on Tuesday, um, where we're going to be discussing what are the ways that we can safely and justifiably discuss um, ancestral states of organisms. This doesn't have to be all the way back at the very origination of life or the origination, origination of cells, um, but I'd like us to be able to get together and talk about what are the criteria that we can safely use to evaluate whether or not something was present in an ancestor of a group, and um, when we might not be justified to do that. Um, I'm not a vulgar guy, but I'll, I'll put this up because it was funny. Um, I'm not trying to trash any, any work right here. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm actually just trying to be constructive. Um, this, this editorial is actually really, really nice, and, he, and the editor talks about um, what's, what it's like to be an editor and get all these nice reviews or sometimes mean reviews and what you should do as an author about that. But I just want to make the point that I'm not trying to trash anything because I know that's easy to do. I'm trying um, with everybody here to put together these different puzzle pieces and, tr and try to find some robust c conclusions. So back to my main topic here, um, kind of the, asking this question, what are the ways that the first cells conserved energy? How did they take chemical act? chemical reactions, use chemical potentials that exist in the environment, and save it temporarily so that they can order their cells? How can they maintain themselves and then also reproduce? And so I said, um, to get everybody on the same page of this concept of energy conservation, I would go to a very basic level, and I will. Um, I'll take you guys to my freshman biology class um, where I start to talk about energy conservation. And this isn't a perfect analogy, but it's, it's reasonable. Let's take a look at the left, and if you drop a rock um, off of a cliff, you can take potential energy and convert it into kinetic energy, and then when it hits the ground, it turns into heat and noise energy. Now, you can save some of that energy when the rock drops. You can put like a little rock windmill in there, and then you can use that rock windmill later on to do some work. And this is kind of what biology does. So let's um, get ready for a few molecules here. This is kind of what biology does here. Here's the pathway of glycolysis. In the middle up here, there's a blurry molecule of glucose. That's kind of the rock that's on top of the cliff. It doesn't have any um, potential energy due to gravity at all, but it does have potential energy in the form of chemical energy as you go to pyruvate and lactate. And as it drops energetically, what life is able to do is save some of that energy off on the left. And that's by turning a little uh, crank. It's not really a gear. It's an enzyme that smashes together um, phosphate and ADP, and it makes ATP. And so this is the way that life saves or conserves energy by substrate-level phosphorylation. Now, there are three ways that biology is known to save energy. One is by using this process here either in glycolysis or some other set of reactions, um, but they all have in common that they take a phosphate group and they, and they put it onto another phosphate group, and that gives them kind of a little molecular spring to drive reactions with, and also sometimes people, people discuss it as some dehydration power because you're actually losing a water molecule when you put two phosphates together. And so life saves this ATP, and that's what we often call like the energy currency of life. It doesn't necessarily have to be like that, but it seems like that's what it uses today. And again, this is this concept of phos substrate level phosphorylation. Let's compare dropping a rock off the cliff and having it go through a rock windmill and lifting a, lifting a bucket to this. You're taking a different form of energy, but you're saving it. In one case, you're saving it with a bucket that you lift up. And in this case, you're saving it in a form, another form of chemical energy. And so what life is doing across all the diversities of life is taking different types of rocks, i.e. metabolites, and changing them all into a common currency, ATP. And that's very useful for the cell because then it can go and drive multiple different reactions with various chemical potentials. So this is the concept of substrate level phosphorylation. The other, um, mechanism of energy conservation that I want to talk to you about today is the concept that was introduced um, to us by Mitchell, um, energy conservation by um, chemiosmosis. And so in this case, um, the rock, the chemical potential that's there is shown as some electrons over here on the left in blue that are at a reduced potential and as they moved to a more oxidized potential onto something like oxygen or nitrate or manganese, um, that energy release can be used to do some work. This time it's not done in the way of putting two phosphates together. It's done by extruding protons um, across a membrane. And so this is an actual pump um, 
And so we can get by using analogies um, about machines in this stage because the, what the protein is actually doing here is as an electron moves through it to one of these acceptors, the protein is saving, it's conserving energy by uh, having uh, conformational changes occur through the protein and it's actually squeezing out a, pro a proton from the inside to the outside. And if the cell does that a bunch of times, you can get a bunch of these yellow protons on the outside of the cell. And then later on, you can use another machine um, to allow that uh, chemical potential when it gets dissipated to put two phosphates together. It's substrate level phosphorylation, but it's accomplished by utilizing uh, chemi chemical energy in the form of a membrane spanning ion potential, and that's what we call chemiosmosis. This is the second out of three ways that we know biology works today. It's remarkable, there's only three ways. One is substrate level phosphorylation, and one is substrate level phosphorylation coupled to chemiosmosis. The other one has to do with electron transfer, and I don't have time to talk about it today. Um, but I want us to ask, um, what, what is the way that the first um, cell um, or if, if we go liberally, the first non-compartmentalized uh, form of life used to take chemical potentials and turn them, in, them into a common um, set of uh, molecules that it could drive a metabolism with. Was it substrate level phosphorylation or was it chemiosmosis or was it something else? It might be something else. Let's delve a little bit deeper into this chemiosmosis topic because many people have said, um, or at least some people that I apparently listen to and call many, um, have said that chemiosmosis is the primordial feature of cells, and all cells do this, so therefore the, the first cell um, does that. I showed you one possible way of generating a chemiosmotic potential, but I'd like to um, remind everybody or introduce you to the topic that there are a number of different ways of generating chemo chemical chemiosmotic potentials in a cell, and basically we can break it down into two, two things. One is you remove positive charge from the cell. That's what that proton pump was doing. It was taking a positive ion and it was shoving it outside of the cell. And that results in the outside being more positive and the inside being more negative. Or the other way to do this is to put negative charge inside of the cell. So the same thing happens. The inside of the cell becomes more negative uh, than the outside. And life is known to operate in both of these different ways at these general classes. And so what, are, what would be a way that the first form of life could, could accomplish something like this um, if that's indeed what it, what it was doing? Um, oftentimes, methanogens and acetogens, um, which I mentioned in my abstract, are introduced as possible organisms that would have accomplished this in a way that was similar to the first cells. And people suggest this because they look a little bit simple. It looks like you can just take CO2 on the top and deliver electrons in the form of hydrogen, hydrogen gas, and make methane. And you can run two pumps and make a chemiosmotic potential, and everything's great. Um, these pumps, though, are, are quite complicated, I'd like to suggest to you. And that's why I listed the, the number of protein subunits that comprises each pump. Remember what these, these pumps are doing is taking one form of chemical energy and, and actually using that chemical energy to uh, perform conformational changes in the protein and actually squeeze ions out of the, out of the membrane. And it takes um, biology at least eight or nine uh, individual peptide subunits to come together in exactly the right way to do this. So I, I think this is quite a complicated um, mechanism that we have here. Let's look at acetogens. Um, uh, which are oftentimes thought to also be simple. They do a metabolism that looks a lot like methanogenesis, except for it's branched, and instead of making methane, they make acetate. Um, and again, they can exist with only two pumps inside of them, too. They use a different variety. It's called RNF. Um, it happens to be able to run with six protein subunits, so it looks a little bit simpler. Again, the ATPase um, actually has to use uh, nine different subunits. It's pretty complicated. Um, so I... I when I learned this, I thought, oh, this is really, really too hard for the first types of cells to learn. And I started looking for other ways that life might be able to conserve energy. Um, and I'll introduce that topic to you. But before I do, um, I just want to um, go a little bit deeper into these diagrams. These diagrams are kind of complicated. There's a lot of arrows. Um, but this chemiosmotic nature of these cells here results in a really, really remarkable similarity. And that remarkable similarity goes right to the heart of chemiosmotic potential. 
That similarity comes, can be viewed in this uh, slanted graph here um, that Steve Zinder plotted in 1993, where he's plotting the chemical potential of the energy of the metabolism, making methane or making acetate, as a function of the hydrogen partial pressure. How, mu how many, what's the electron availability um, and how, how reducing is the solution to drive the reaction? And where does the metabolism stop? It turns out that both of these, let's see where my cursor is, here it is. Both of these things stop right around 30 kilojoules per mole um, of chemical reaction energy. That is, you can take a methanogen or an acetogen, which looks similar, but they actually have different chemiosmotic pumping units. You can stick them in a room full of hydrogen, and they will consume the hydrogen all the way until there's only enough to result in a Gibbs free energy of the reaction to be around 30 kilojoules per mole. So this, um, I think, is a product of the chemiosmotic potential and how, how much energy it actually takes to pump a single ion across the membrane. So this metabolism is driven by hydrogen gas combining onto CO2 and eventually making methane. How much energy does it, does it take to do that? Or what's the concentration of hydrogen that, that it takes to do that? The concentration to do that and make it thermodynamically favorable is extremely low. However, to conserve energy or to save energy during the process, you actually have to have enough to pump at least a single ion. And that's probably why both methanogens and acetogens stop at the same chemical potential. But because they have one makes methane and one makes acetate, methanogens can always outcompete acetogens for hydrogen. So because of, um, not because of the chemiosmotic potential, but because simply because one makes methane and one makes acetate, what we're seeing here is a profound ecological difference between methanogens and acetogens, and it's all coming down to how much, uh, how much energy it takes to, to push an ion across the, the membrane. Um, back to this question of complexity and whether or not any of this is relevant to our consideration of the first cells. I said that the ATPase takes at least nine different protein subunits to function, and it does, and here's a picture of it, um, which now that I look at it, I realize I haven't counted it, so it looks like it's actually really complicated. Um, but that's the, there's a lot of those L copies in there, but we could count those as one. Here it is, this is a cartoon diagram, but it's, it's very complicated. The way it works is that it's actually spinning around in there, and as it's spinning around, it can bind ADP and phosphate and move them together. It, it operates kind of like a, a Vonkel engine. Um, if any of you are Mazda aficionados and you know about the RX-7, um, it operates kind of like that engine. Um, <laughs> we can talk cars later. So you've got something that operates, and you can compare it to a Vonkel engine, um, and people have, because um, it works in these three different cycles with these lobes. And we can ask ourselves, how, how can we ever think about the first cells existing with a membrane and having a protein complex like this embedded in it? And I don't know how to do that. I think this is a really big problem for us. Um, and what I, what I want to consider um, with you, and I'm, I'm going to welcome your comments here in a few moments, is what, what are the ways that earlier energy conservation could have been operative here? What I've done on the right here in this little table is just taken um, kind of a, a little bucket list of early or simple protein complexes that are able to conserve energy with a chemiosmotic potential. And just for simplicity, for us to quickly judge the level of complexity that we're talking about here, I've listed the number of protein subunits um, associated with those, 6, 6, 13, 8, 8 9. So we're, I think that we're talking about a really, a quite late and advanced stage in biological evolution by the time we're talking about using some of these protein pumps. And so that got me thinking, how could this ever happen? And as I said before, there's two ways that cells can actually generate a chemiosmotic potential. One is to use a pump, and one is to just have an input of electrical charge inside of it. Last year, um, two years ago now, two years ago we discovered uh, a brand of archaea that covers itself with a conductive protein blanket. And it's able to export electrons from itself. And so what I started considering was the reverse of the process that we discovered two years ago. It, would it be possible to run a methanogenic cell in the way of having direct electrons enter into the cell and in that way generate a chemiosmotic potential 
by virtue simply of proton consumption. So anytime you reduce CO2, it, it requires uh, hydrogen to do that in the form of protons, and that might be a way of inputting um, a negative charge into the cell and generating a chemiosmotic potential. And what I'm trying to get at here is to imagine a selection pressure that might have resulted in the emergence of these pumps at some point in, in biological history. You could do this with any, any autotrophic metabolism. You could take the RCA cycle, you could take an acetogen. Anytime you put electrons onto CO2, it requires protons, and so you can consume protons this way and make a chemiosmotic potential. But where would the electrons come from? Where would the organic carbon f come from for this whole process to be happening? And what about the catalysts? Um, I blew my cover earlier, and I told you I was going to talk a little bit about hydrothermal events um, today. And I started considering, what about this possibility kind of riffing on uh, Mike Russell's concepts where if there was a um, high pH um, full loaded with hydrogen, hydrothermal vent, um, surrounded by um, our kind of a slightly acidic ocean, it seems like I got my number wrong compared to the last talk. It should be around 6.5, I think, compared to uh, Werner's uh, calculation. We, but you have a slightly acidic ocean, and what this does um, between acid and bases, it gives you a Nernstian potential. It makes the hydrogen more reducing or a more, more electronegative. And we could make a cartoon diagram like this where you could have hydrogen oxidation uh, coupled to CO2 reduction, but that would happen over a conductive mineral layer here. And so maybe that would be a way of uh, accumulating organic carbon on the surface of one of these vents. Um, and this is kind of totally inspired by uh, my colleagues uh, Nakamura-san and, and Yamamoto-san, who actually discovered that a lot of hydrothermal vents are electronically conductive. And then this is where um, I'm really um, dreaming here. Um, but maybe this be, would be a way for cells to actually be living there and generating a chemiosmotic potential simply by influx of um, negative charge and not having any pumps. So possibly before the origination of chemiosmotic pumping, there was the introduction of negative charge in a way that led to a selection pressure that would allow pumps to exist. Okay, this is all just dreams. How are we gonna do it in the lab? We're starting to make um, hydro, kind of very simple, si simple simulated hydrothermal vents where we pump a solution of iron and carbonate and other carbon compounds in on the left. We put that into a sulfitic solution on the right. We can make a iron sulfur layer and we can ask this question, can you actually oxidize hydrogen and, cu and couple that to CO2 reduction or other carbon molecule reduction? In this flat diagram, the thing on the left would be the ocean. That side of the layer would be the ocean, and the, and the solution on the right would be the actual hydrothermal um, vent uh, solution. Uh, so uh, Wu Jie Chang, who's uh, been a visitor um, supported by the EON program twice now, he's, he's now working on this. And also uh, Victor Sojo, who is with, with us today, he came up with uh, the same idea independently, um, and uh, he's now a visitor at, at RECAN, and he's supported by an um, EMPO fellowship, um, and we're collaborating together. Victor's using a more uh, organized solution um, than what we're using, um, but they both uh, accomplish the same goal. And the uh, overall experiments that we can start to do is pump this thing up full of iron, gotta go fast, pump it up full of iron and uh, carbon solution, hydrogen on the other side, and ask this question. Again, the thing we're looking at, do you get electron transfer from one side to the other, hydrogen oxidation coupled to CO2 reduction? Um, that's pretty hard, and we're not sure about it. Chris Butch had the good idea, thanks Chris, to put uh, an already reduced carbon molecule in there and use that to test. We've got these really weak and sketchy NMR peaks that seem like oxalic acid was turned into um, an, an alcohol, and we're currently working on developing that more. We've also got even more weak data where it looks like we're seeing acetate, but hold on, because I, I don't want to present that to you until I'm more sure about it. Um, these are just very, very preliminary results that um, are aimed at testing the hypothesis that organic material could accumulate on the exterior of a hydrothermal vent, and that might have been an area where chemical evolution might be happening. Previous hypotheses on the origin of life have all said it was happening on the inside. I want to suggest to you that the outside is a more, uh, is a more reasonable location, and uh, I'm so far out of time. This is, um, I want us to remember 
that when people talk about hydrothermal vents in the origin of life, everybody's talking about a different thing, and they don't often acknowledge that. And this is just a slide. Ask me for it later, and I'll discuss for it later. I don't have time to talk about it. But ever since 1993, when Mike Russell and colleagues started talking about hydrothermal vents in the origin of life, these concepts have been presented in slightly different ways, and I think that's a little bit confusing. It's OK. It's a complicated world. But be careful when you hear somebody talking about the origin of life. Finally, I have wonderful colleagues, Ryuhei Nakamura, Wuji Chang, and I'm really happy that Victor Sojo has come to Japan and is working in collaboration now. And these are my summary remarks. Thank you very much for your time. Do we have questions? On the far side there first. Hey, here. Uh, I think that what you said about the Martin paper, I, don't, I think you should write that up. And that's kind of important that that be understood by everybody. So I would like to encourage you to do that. But um, that's not my question. My question is about um, <laughs> my question is about gradients and chemiosmosis. And you know, you said that that's universal to all cells. But you know, that you could say that there's a huge list of things, right? Phosphorylation, condensation, dehydration. And so I don't I don't quite understand why you have chosen that. As, I mean, you can store energy all kinds of different ways chemically, and some of them are very easy. And it seems like you, like you, like you said, if you look at these synthetases, they're so complicated. So I'm, I'm just not understanding why you're focused on the chemiosmosis as something early in the origin of life. Cool. Thanks for that question, and thanks for your encouragement, too. Um, I would like to be more focused on something like substrate level phosphorylation. Um, the trouble with substrate level phosphorylation is it just takes more chemical potential to drive it um, if, if you use ATP and ADP as cells use it today. However, this is all just a function of concentrations, right? And so um, what I would like to learn more about and consider together is um, what, how far from equilibrium were the first cells. That's what this is going to come down to. In many ways, it seems like these chemiosmotic cells, these methanogens and acetogens, they've just become super, super adept at living with really, really low chemical potentials. They both stop at mi minus 30 kilojoules per mole because they both pump one to two ions at one chemiosmotic step. That's about as low as we know anything can go. And so in one way, it seems like they're super, super adapted to low chemical potentials. Um, yeah, so I'm not necessarily tied to it. Yeah. And I, th I think it would be better if we could, it would be very helpful if we could consider other sets of molecules that chemical energy could be channeled into and then used broadly distributed in a metabolic network. And I'm not sure exactly what that is, but let's talk more later. Thanks. Yeah, commented a question. You noticed that in his question, he used energy storage rather than energy conservation. I can, I can support that wholeheartedly as a physicist because energy conservation is the first law of thermodynamics and uh, everything does it, not just life forms that are trying to set, I would say storage of free energy might be even more appropriate comment. Question, in these nine unit things and the six unit things, I think you called them RNF, these are transmembrane proteins or, in any case, have you looked at the, f the phylogenetic trees of the various versions of them to see if they have a, I don't know, a common ancestor in which you might say, oh, there were three subunits and they were, th they overlap between them, or are you saying when you, were they nine separate subunits that did not overlap with the six, or and there's no connection identifiable between them? Um, I, haven't, I haven't done that, and uh, maybe other people have, and if anybody else in the room has already done that, uh, please pipe up. Well, I know there's ATP yeah. synthase trees, but I've never yeah. seen anyone try to connect that to what you call RNF tree. Yeah, yeah, you can, yeah, and you can make the RNF tree. Um, it comes down to there's going to be subunits that look like it and are similar to it, but don't bind to it. And so then it's, you have to only consider the ones that are f the full package. It's kind of like looking at the evolution of the eye, you know, like it happened with all these different things happening unrelated. And then eventually it started forming this complex. Um, so there's still proteins that are out there that look like these different subunits, but they're different, t doing different jobs. Um, so I think it makes that analysis a little bit hard. But again, I haven't actually done that analysis. If anybody has, it would be cool to talk about. It's a good question. Eric? Sean, hi. There were two points in your talk where there were sort of equally urgent things where I wanted to hear your opinion because you've thought well about some of this. I agree with your point about not wanting to trash articles. There's no use in that. But at the same time, 
within proper phylogenetics, people have put a lot of effort into defining things like maximum likelihood methods and Bayesian methods for which they understand the properties of these statistical approaches as probability models. Now, they're often underspecified, and so they leave out a lot of what we would like to consider in data. But one of the reasons people don't just dream up criteria and then write papers about them is that criteria with no known properties give you answers that you don't know how to interpret. And so for a lot of these deep protein phylogenies and questions about what is in old organisms, I have wondered how much of this can we referee by putting it against models with known properties and figuring out whether we believe it at all. But before I ask you to answer that, there's a question barely related to it because this is in the domain of semantic material, semantic information that's hard to put into maximum likelihood models but seems relevant. It's to Nick's point about where we place old ATP synthases and the complexity of them. In addition to the protein itself, if I look at methanogens, the role of the ATP synthase is outside both the energy branch and the carbon fixation branch of the one carbon system. You use it to capture energy to do the rest of what the cell needs to do. If I put, look at acetogens, the ATP synthase stands actually between the energy branch and the carbon fixation branch. So if it were not there, the fundamental function of using the C1 metabolism to couple an exergonic process to a carbon fixation would be impaired. So architecturally, they have extremely different roles. So when we look at that and we try to figure out, even if they are deep or basal clades, respectively, in archaea and bacteria, we look at the very different roles of the ATP synthase architecturally in the two systems, and then we know that phylogenetic reconstruction for these things that have more than one homologous group are difficult. What is the right way to think in a disciplined way about what ancient organisms look like and what they had? Thank you. <laughs> <That's>, uh, <laughs> yeah, I have a lot to think about now. <laughs> um, for, the, for the first question, um, I don't, yeah, I don't know of the literature where people have taken sequences, if, if this isn't done, let's do it. Let's take sequences and put them in little artificial cells and then have them evolve with a certain uh, evolutionary model and then build trees and then build trees and then let it go and keep building trees. I do know of examples um, where it seems pretty obvious just based on actual domains. And so when we, when we have sequence information and we, and, and we also have uh, domain information, sometimes these domains can swap around. And, you, and, you, and this is a glaring example where you know your, sequ your sequence alignment is wrong, um, but it works, you can align anything. Um, and in these, in, in these cases, I, I do know of cases where the branching order does swap around. And so something that should be very, very far out and ends up being basal um, because based on the model, that becomes the most probable thing. Um, but it, you, you have to supervise the, the computer when you do this. Um, it, it might be worthwhile considering some simulations if people haven't done to do that. The other way to do that is to go to the lab and, and let, the, let the microbes crank. Um, but that takes more time than the simulation. Um, the second question about methanogens and acetogens and this different structure that accomplishes roughly the same thing, um, I don't, it would, I don't know why there's not a third way. Um, this is a, a, a way to back out of answering that complicated question. But there is kind of a third way. The methanogens and the acetogens both come in, a di in at least you know, three different flavors a piece. Um, and they all have different protein subunits. And they're all accomplishing the same reaction, but they do it with different enzyme arrangements or architectures inside of the cell. And so in my head, I think, oh, this is part of, the this is part of how material responds to an energy flow. This is how it can get organized. And in methanogens and acetogens, it's somewhat degenerate in the sense that they both pull the hydrogen concentration to the pretty much the exact same chemical potential, but they're doing it in different ways. Um, yeah, I think the only way for me to safely back out um, is to say, like, what, what would be the other ways that that could work? And that might be good to look for. There's, there should be different acetogens out there. 
too that don't link the processes in the same way maybe or if there's not maybe it's something really special so I don't, i'm not quite sure about that yeah, very cool thank you next question here um i just to follow up on that a little bit i think it is interesting that you focus on acetogenesis methanogenesis because there are um arguments against looking at those as, as ancient forms of metabolism, that they may be more derived, uh, Nitschke and Russell's work, um, th where they're looking at those processes and saying that they must be more derived because you only see acetogenesis in bacteria, you only see methanogenesis in archaea, and so they may have been derived much later on, well, far after the LUCA. Um, that's more of a comment than a question, though. Um, but I was wondering if you could touch a, a little bit on a statement you made earlier about how it's more likely that you would find this early metabolism on the outside of the vents than on the inside of the vents. Can you explain why you feel that way? So the, for, the, for the first concept, I think you're completely right. And I think that all the stuff that I've talked about here today, which references modern biology, might be totally misguided to talk about biology in any way four billion years ago. <laughs> I'm so comfortable um, with saying that. I, I'm a little bit radical that I would be totally fine if there's a completely alternative genetic code or no genetic code or something four billion years ago and a totally different type of metabolism. So this is part of what I also want to talk about at our after shop is how far can we go? Um, we've got... We've got some de decent rock data that there was life based on light isotopes at like 3.8 billion years ago, but so what? Maybe it was a different form of life that didn't didn't do anything like that. And what are what are our safeguards? So I think this is a totally valid concern, and it would be awesome to figure out ways to guard ourselves against that. The second question um, is only because of this concept of the Nernstein potential difference. So if, if you take Hydrogen at pH zero, the way we define it is that the redox potential is zero. That is, it's not, it doesn't want to give electrons out. It's at equilibrium with taking them. And as you crank the pH up higher and higher, hydrogen, H2, becomes more, less and less stable. And it wants to shoot out its electrons more and more. Or when the electrons get shot out, it is at a more, more reducing potential. So if you can do that at pH 10, the electrons really come screaming out of the hydrogen. And if those, if those electrons go over a conductive mineral wall, they can hit the carbon and reduce it. So thermodynamically, you can't re it's really hard to have um, carbon reduction in the inside because the redox potential of the carbon also gets more and more negative. So the, the, t the two things shift. But if you can separate the protons from the carbon but not the electrons, that's when you can have the energy flow happen really um, thermodynamically favorable. Thank you. Very great talk. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Last question over here. Okay. Uh, it's Make very it a good exciting. One. Now, uh, quickly. Uh, so, so this means the pH, the gradient in pH, is a reason why I think this is a good location. And uh, is there any other locations, on earlier that this kind of uh, pH gradient might have existed, other than hydrothermal systems? Uh, yes, um, although I'd like other people to help me out because they know more about the earth um, <laughs> with that. So, but to st step back as, as a kind of physiologist and, and go back to this hydrogen thing, when we look at methanogens and acetogens today, whether or not that's a good guide for us um, is another question. They're able to live on these low hydrogen partial pressures because they can take the energy that's happening later on in the, in the formation of methane and kind of pipe that energy back up to the initial step um, and so and they have to do that they have to pipe the energy up um, because there's not enough hydrogen concentration which means that the redox potential is not negative enough to drive carbon reduction in this case it should just be spontaneous and the whole thing like if if there's catalysts you know so this is the thing the thermodynamics are there but who knows if the catalysts are there um, but it becomes a kinetic problem and not a and not a thermodynamic with the ambient concentrations that you might be able to get out of one of these vents your question is um, where else would this have to be? Um, it depends on what we think the original electron donor for life was. Um, and so before the oxygenation of the planet, there probably wasn't a lot of high potential acceptors around. So this gets us back to our morning talk with Eric. When you have high electron, high potential, very positive electron acceptors around, it's kind of a whole different metabolic world than when you only have low potential electron donors around. These cells are using CO2 as an electron acceptor, which kind of sucks, but they're able to do that, and they can only do that because they can pipe the energy back up. 
us, we can go eat our onigiri and we burn it with oxygen and we can, we can, you know, we can, we can do all sorts of stuff because there's so much energy in that couple. So we do need to consider very, very seriously if hydrogen is the only real electron acceptor for the origin of, uh, of cells or for powering them. There might be other ones. What else do we have? We've got ferrous iron. Midpoint potential is not good. Um, so if, if we're limited to hydrogen, we do have to think about how we can charge those electrons up. Biology does it today by rerouting the electrons back up. This is a way that would circumvent that. Um, but it, yeah, I'll try to think. Okay, uh, let's thank the speaker yeah, one more time.